Well, hey there, everyone, and welcome to our podcast. This episode was recorded in our adult Sunday school class and features our longtime teacher, Miss Jeannie. We hope you enjoy this teaching. Now, let's get into the lesson. Good morning, y'all. We're going to get started. If you will, this morning, get in the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel. And if you don't have a, a lesson book, there's still lesson books available, and y'all need to study them. Because how many of you know that God's Word is new and fresh every morning? And how many of you know that I don't stick with the lesson? So the church pays a lot of money for those books, so y'all don't waste them. Amen. Amen. So you're going to wonder why I'm in 2 Samuel this morning, but that's okay. 2 Samuel 23. 2 Samuel 23 is where we're going to start. Happy Father's Day. <clears throat> we're going to talk for a minute this morning. Whether you ever had any flesh and blood children or not, you're still a father. And I can say Happy Father's Day to everybody that's a male in this room. And I can say Happy Father's Day to some women who have been fathers in the lives of their children. Amen. There's a difference between being a father and a mother. Amen. I had somebody call me last week and they said they, they were in disagreement about their son doing something. And um, I said, well, what does their daddy say? And she got real quiet and she said, well, I'm not agreeing with her daddy. And I said, well, your, dad, your husband's saved and he's living in your house, so you're not in charge. The priest of the home, if the man is godly, who's the priest of the home? Now, that doesn't make him the, what would you call her, the home? He's not a, yeah, he's not a tyrant. He's not a tyrant. You pray together, but there has to be, in every situation, there has to be a final decision. And sometimes, a final decision has to be made by one person. Amen? A one person. And in our church... We trust that God has provided us with a great pastor, and he's the final decision. We were up here, a wedding was yesterday, and we were up here Friday night and helping them get set up and do all that stuff. And pastor was here, and I had to go with him to ask him about something, and he had to make the final what? Decision. And I didn't stomp my foot and say, I don't like your decision, although I didn't. <laughs> but the Bible says for us to be peaceful with one another. And being peaceful means that sometimes you have to turn it loose and let it go and trust that God's using somebody else. Amen? And one of the things in the, in the United States right now that is a situation is that we need godly men to step up. In our church, we've got godly men. Our walk, we told our men years ago that our walk children do not have men in their lives. And our men in this church, and thank you to every one of you, our men in this church have stepped up to be there for our boys. Even if you never actually talk and mentor to them, seeing a man here makes a difference. And we can be in that gym, and they can be rowdy, and a man can say, What? That's God-ordained. Amen? There's a, a, a hierarchy. And this girl on the phone that called me, she said, now, Miss Jeannie, Mr. Ted's quiet. And you do a lot that you want to do. I said, yes, that's true. But I said, in raising our children, when it had to be a final decision, I deferred to Ted. And a lot of times I didn't like Ted's answer, lots of times. But I deferred to Ted because he was the man of the house. And I said, and it kept peace in our house. And I said, and I told this mama, I said, I'm going to tell you something that you're going to learn. There are times when especially teenage boys need men. They need men. And it doesn't have to be the daddy that birthed them. It needs to be a daddy in their life. Ted comes up here on Tuesday night. If any of you ever want to come up here on a Tuesday night and hang out with Ted, he's here every Tuesday night. He is in the gym from 6 to 7.30 He's 72 years old, and he plays basketball on Tuesday night with a bunch of young bucks. <laughs> and they are a good bunch of basketball players. But he started doing that 20-something years ago. He went out on the basketball court, and he just went out there and dribbled a basketball. And men started coming up, boys started coming off the road, off 301, can I play ball? And it started a ministry. And they did it for a long time outside, 
And Ted would do a 10-minute lesson within the hour of church, a 10-minute lesson. And he found out that all these young men, boys, they needed a male influence in their life. And Ted's the quietest man I know. But he would give that lesson, and he would be there, and they started calling him pet names. You know, Mr. Ted, Uncle Ted, started calling him, getting, wanting his phone number, talking to him about things in their lives. Some, some that are grown with their own children stay in touch. They moved it inside when we were blessed with the gym, and he's in here on Tuesday nights, and it's a moving crowd. You know, some will come for a little while, and then they're gone, and then they come back. It's a moving crowd. But those young men are between 18 and Actually, I think he's got one now that's in his 40s. They need men in their lives. So if you ever want to just come and even if you say, gee, I can't play basketball anymore, you can sit here and encourage them. Our lesson's going to be talking about sitting for a few minutes this morning. Sometimes it's not what you say. Amen? It's your presence. It's your presence. We have men on Wednesdays that work in the kitchen. Do you know what it does to our young boys when they see a man in the kitchen? Amen? Who cooks our perlo? Men. Who fries the fish? Men. Who does Saturday morning breakfast? Men. They need to see that. So that's part of our lesson this morning. It's not in your lesson book. It's not really a Father's Day lesson. But the way the Lord and the Holy Spirit have spoken to me about it this morning, we're going to go that way a little bit. So hang with me. Let's go to prayer. Father, we are grateful to be in your house this morning. We thank you for the rain Glory, 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 we thank you for the rain. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given to us. We thank you for protection. Lord, we don't know how many times that you protected us this week. But we thank you and we give you glory and we thank you for the word. Father, I thank you for the preciousness of the Old Testament. I love the new, but Father, thank you for the lessons that we can glean. And Father, I pray a blessing over every man that's here this morning. A blessing over their lives. Father, help us to encourage them and lift them up. I pray for our young men in our church this morning. Father, open their hearts and their lives to the understanding of the word. Make them hungry for the word this morning. I pray for our pastor as he brings the word today. And for the worship, Father God, that you'd be in it through it all. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Second Samuel 23. 2 Samuel 23, verse 20. Let me get there. We were talking the other day about um, the New Living Testament, which is what the Assembly God's using now um, in Sunday school classes. I'm not crazy in love with the NLT. How many of y'all love NLT? <laughs> I'm not crazy about it. I mean, it's fine for, for, for some study, but it, it's, I'm just not crazy about it. But I want to use it in Sunday school because that's what the lesson is using. But I also want to be able to get back sometimes to using... Uh, New King James, and uh, I don't, some of the translations, I'm not, I don't want to get into all that this morning, but how many of you know sometimes you like to go back to that original, what you're used to? Okay, so y'all may see some of that in the next few weeks. Samuel's chapter 23, and let's get to verse 20. There was also Benai, verse 20, 2 Samuel 23, verse 20. There was also Benai. Does God know you by name? The Bible says God knew you before he fitly knit knit you in your mother's womb. So God knows you by name. And I love the way it says this. There was also Banea. Pastor preached a sermon one time that I absolutely loved. And it was meanwhile back at the ranch. Because we forget sometimes that why God is doing why God is doing something here, while God is doing something here, he's doing something all over the world at the same time. Amen. And we, uh, in our prayer this morning, we really do not recognize sometimes what God is doing. We turned the corner this morning and uh, down the way we come and a herd, not one, a herd of cows ran out. They'd gotten out and the, the lead cow, I hollered, Ted! And he got stopped and got moved over. Because where we were, we were not expecting a herd of cows, Right? They had gotten away and come through another person's yard and, and were on the road. And boom, that could have been tragic for the mama cow and us, right? And God spared us even this morning on the way to church. 
from something that, that could have been really bad. God's doing that in our lives all the time. And we need to realize that. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, he's doing something. Our prayers get answered. But I heard something good yesterday that I liked. It said, but where I'm praying, there's a lot of heavenly traffic. That made sense to me. Because I grew up where there was no traffic. And now y'all all came. And we have lots of traffic. And I'm a country girl. And traffic frustrates me. I've got CDs I'm listening to in the car now. Scripture pouring it into me. Because traffic frustrates me. And I don't want to get somewhere and be aggravated. Right? So I need something in the car to remind me. That the steps of a righteous man or woman are ordered to the Lord. And if you're stuck in traffic, there's a reason. And you need to behave yourself and get on with things. Right? So in here it says, There was also Benai, son of Jehoiada, a valiant warrior from Kabzeel. He did many heroic deeds. Now, he did many heroic deeds. Which included killing two champions of Moab. Another time, on a snowy day, he chased a lion down into a pit and killed it. Once, armed only with a club, he killed an imposing Egyptian warrior who was armed with a spear. But Nai wrenched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. Deeds like these made Benai as famous as the three mightiest warriors. He was more honored than the other members of the 30, though he was not one of the three, and David made him captain of his bodyguard. Now, we look at Benai and we think, whoa, Benai, he's way cool. But he wasn't one of the three, right? How many disciples did Jesus have? Twelve. He had twelve disciples. When he went up on the mountain, how many did he take with him? Three. Three. Did he love them more than he loved the other ones? Were they more special than the other ones? But if you were one of the 12 disciples and you weren't one of the three, could it have bothered you that you didn't get picked? We know it. We know as humans, we know as humans that that might bother us, right? God calls you for a job that he planned on you to do before you were born. Don't you think that God knows best where you are and what you're doing. But many times we want to say, nah, God doesn't know best. I can fix that. I can do that better. Go to Second, First Chronicles 4.10. 1 Chronicles 4.10. Now this, both of these um, scriptures were used in a book. One, the book, um, In a Pit on a Snowy Day, was written by Mark. Oh, I forget Mark's last name. It'll come to me in a minute. Anyway, he wrote a book about that. And there was a whole book written about the prayer of Jab Jabez. I don't mean how y'all remember that book. But it was, a good, it was a good book. And it's written on a very um, specific piece of scripture. 1 Chronicles 4.10. 4, 10. Start with 9. Now there was a man named Jabez. Again, he's being called by name. There was a man named Jabez. Who was more honorable than any of his brothers... His mother named him Jabez because his birth had been so painful. Oh, lucky him. He got an ugly name that was reminding his whole life that his mama suffered when he was born. Wouldn't you just love to be called Jabez? But it says he was more honorable than any of his brothers. He was the one who prayed to the God of Israel, and this is what he prayed. Oh, that you would bless me and expand my territory. Please be with me in all that I do and keep me from all trouble and pain. And God granted him his request. Simple, isn't it? It's simple. And yet it was important enough that God made sure it was in Scripture and he was called by name and it was understood that he was honorable and God heard him. Now, going back to what I heard in that sermon, it said there are a lot of prayers. Remember, there were prayers that went up and, the, and um, God said they, were, um, they, they took more time because there was warfare in the heavenlies, right? Back to the ranch. When you pray, 
immediately Satan is going to attack you. And Satan is going to steal or try to steal the thought processes of that prayer from you. And one of the first things that he'll use is, you're not worthy, right? And maybe you grew up in a household where your voice was not worthy. And so without realizing it, you go back to that childhood of not being heard. But the Bible says when you get saved, you're his baby. You're God's child. God hears you. And God acts on your behalf. And you say, well, it's not happening. It's not happening in your time. How many of you are old enough to know that God's timing is perfect? God's timing is perfect. He's not early. He's not late. He's right on time for your life. But many times we think God didn't do it right. And we're angry about it. And some of us had to go years down the road to find out God was right. God was right. I love that song that says, I thank God for unanswered prayers. Right? Because he prayed and wanted this and God said no. And, and he didn't get it and later on he realized. Some of you, lots of stories of how you prayed. All right, now we're going to New Testament. Go to Luke 18. Luke 18. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you this, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be what? Humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. So the tax collector is standing in the temple and he's praying. And he's not praying like the Pharisees with the big loud voice and the, ooh, look at me. And all of that. He's so humbled that he's in the corner and he can't hardly speak. He's just beating his chest. Some of us have been there. Some of us feel unworthy. And we've been there. And Jesus is telling them right here. And I believe he didn't use the man's name. I believe he used the example of a tax collector because it had more of an emphasis. He's telling them right here that it's the humble prayer that God hears. It's the prayer of a humble heart. It doesn't have to be this big, beautiful prayer. Amen? I didn't have time this morning to say, Hey, Ted, be careful. There's a mama cow and a calf and a herd of cows coming behind her. You might better step on your brake. All I had time to do was what? Stop, Ted. Right? God is saying that your prayers do not have to be these eloquent prayers that, that cross all the T's and dot all the dots. He knows you. He understands your way of, of conversing with Him. But you have to converse with Him. Amen? The Bible says we have not because we ask not. And we have to ask believing. And sometimes you have to ask and say, God, help my unbelief. Right? Because He's trying to teach you. He's trying to get you to grow. Go keep moving in Luke. Luke, uh, Luke 23, verse 34. We're going forward. We're getting to the lesson. We're not there yet. Luke 23, 34. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. Now, the Bible tells us that Jesus is ever interceding in heaven on our behalf. Our lesson tells us, it says, and I'm going to read it. There are four kinds of prayers. Supplications are urgent requests to meet a need. Prayers can refer to any petition addressed to God. Intercession is a term related to a request made to a high official. And giving of thanks is an expression of gratitude. So the lesson this morning talks about four types of prayer. Four types of prayer. We all understand about supplications. God help me, I can't pay my bills this month. Lord help me, I'm out of gas. Lord, I have a child that's wavered. Those supplicating, those, I don't, they're not begging prayers, but they're that kind of need of prayer. Do you understand that? We don't have to beg God, but sometimes we feel the urgency of desperation. Okay? Supplication. Prayers are prayers of petition. All kinds of things we ask for. Intercession, and the Bible calls people to be intercessors. Intercession is interceding on the behalf of others. And if you're called to intercede, a lot of times the Holy Spirit 
likes for you to intercede between 2 and 4 in the morning. I feel like sometimes that that's when the Holy Spirit can really get our attention. But there's times when the Holy Spirit will wake you up in the middle of the night with a particular person on your mind that you're to intercede for. And Jesus understands interceding because he's interceding all the time. And let me just tell you something. He's interceding for you. He's interceding for you. And I can tell you something that I love. Jesus right here said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. How many times in your life has Jesus interceded and said to God, Father, forgive Jeannie because she doesn't know what she's doing. Do you hear me this morning? He didn't just pray over those people on the cross. You know why I know that? Because when Jesus died on the cross, he died for my sins. He knew me then, people. He knew your life then. He knew every place you were going to go. He knew every time you were going to screw up. And he died for you because he loved you. And on that cross, he prayed, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. So Satan will try and beat you up this morning with everything you ever did wrong. Is there anybody in here that has not sinned? Is there anybody in here that never messed up in a relationship? Is there anybody in here that has never broke the law? <laughs> Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Look down at 2334. Keep going. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. The crowd watched and the leaders scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself. If he is really God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers mocked him too by offering him a drink of sour wine. They called out to him, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. <clears throat> a sign was fastened above him with these words. This is the king of the Jews. Now I love specific detail. I love my shirt that says specific prayers get specific pr answers. God right here made this happen. Remember, they went back to Pilate and they said, we don't want this sign. We want you to change it. And says he says he's king of the Jews. And Pilate says it is what it is. And so it's come down through history to us proclaim truth. The king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So you're the Messiah, aren't you? Prove it by saying, saving yourself and us too while you're at it. Sounds like some people I know. But the other criminal protested. Don't you fear God? Even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes. But this man hasn't done anything wrong. This man on the cross had an encounter with Jesus. And in your life, you have to get along with God. And you have to have an encounter with Jesus. You have to know for yourself that Jesus Christ is Lord, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you, that Jesus Christ paid the debt and your sins are forgiven, and that when you ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, He comes in and you're His child. He's your daddy. He's your papa daddy. Amen? And He does that in our life. And you have to press into that. And where your faith wavers, you have to say, God, help my unbelief. And when you pray that prayer, God will teach you all things. How do I know that? Because that's what the Bible promises. Now, there's not one of us in this room that could learn how to take apart an engine in five minutes. There's not one of us in this room that could learn how to sew a wedding dress in five minutes. Things that God does in our lives take time. Sometimes God gives you an epiphany and you understand it just like that. Sometimes God teaches you one step at a time. Amen? When we built our house, Ted and I bought a piece of uh, land that had a concrete slab poured on it. The people were going to build a house, and then they changed their minds. And so it was a concrete slab, had the plumbing pipe sticking up, and that's what was there. And Ted and I were young and foolish, and, and we decided we could buy that, and we could learn how to build a house, Right? And we did. And we didn't have the internet. We'd get books. And we'd talk to people. 
And we would, we would trade favors with people. Ted was a surveyor. And we would trade favors with people. And we did all this stuff. And we built that house. And we made lots of mistakes. Lots of mistakes when we were building that house. But we didn't build the house in a day. It took years. Back then you didn't have to have um, the permits like you have today. And I was in college, and in the house, we had the studs and the wires running through the studs. And I had a washing machine that you filled with water and changed the dial and filled with water and changed the dial. Y'all didn't have one of those. <laughs> Y'all were blessed. You couldn't have it in the house. It was on the back porch, you know. But when we, when we would wash the clothes, we didn't have a dryer. And I was gone all day to college, so where do you think we hung the clothes? on those electrical wires in the house that ran between the studs. <laughs> Hello? Common sense, people. They do not get wet when they're ha in the house, right? And it was concrete floors. So, ba bing When we decided we want a bigger home, we hooked the Bronco to that house and pulled down two of the walls and added on and went back up. And people said, Jeannie, that's so stupid. Why didn't you just sell that place and build a house somewhere else? Well, we should have because the truth is it costs more to remodel. Than it. But you see, we had the confidence we did it once. We can what? We can do it again. We can do it again. That's how God treats us. He lovingly teaches us what we can handle and we go along. Amen? But this generation wants it right now. You can't appreciate the things of God in an instant. Some of us have had health issues. And God's teaching you as he goes. Amen? And if God just instantly gave you your health back, you probably wouldn't appreciate a life without a migraine. Amen? But as we go along, God teaches us. And then what are we supposed to do? Teaching the lives of somebody else. What God's given you, give to others. Amen? Go to 1 Timothy for a minute, and then we're going to go to, we're going to move on. Onesiphorus was a man who came from Ephesus to specifically meet with Paul and be a comfort in his life. The Bible tells us that when he came, Paul was very appreciative. And I looked this up, and in history, it said at the time when Paul wrote the Timothy letters, at the time, the persecution of Christians during Nero's reign made Rome a very dangerous place to be. Now, if you studied history, what did Nero do? He, he murdered. He murdered. Uh, history tells us that he took some Christians and tied them to stakes and burned them in his garden for light. Yeah, that's what history tells us. So for Onesiphorus to come to find... Paul and be a comfort to him was a great sacrifice because he was going into the lion's den okay instead of running away now we've got some firemen that have, that have been firemen and they can tell you that as a fireman you don't run from the fire go in and put it out Just go ahead and say it go in and put it out irregardless of what it looks like you don't step back and say oh that's a big fire Okay, fight it from outside. There is a lot of spiritual wisdom that you can learn. Don't you know God uses today for us to learn? There's a lot of spiritual wisdom that you can learn from somebody's vocation. Our lesson this morning is about your vocation. What you do and then what God does with what you do. Amen? It's hard to comprehend people who will go in and put it out. But God calls some people to go in and put it out. God calls some people to hold the hose. God calls some people to run up the ladder. My personal favorite would be drive the fire truck. I always wanted to drive the fire truck, right? Okay, if you look at the vocation of fighting fires and as a fireman, they had different jobs and they still do. They have different jobs. Many times in the church, we want somebody else's job. It looks better. It looks like it's more fun. It looks like it gets more accolades. When you're in the man's bathroom scrubbing the toilet, it doesn't feel like the coolest job, right? It's not. It's not. But does it have to be done? Last night, this wedding that was here 
we had told the family of this wedding, they don't attend our church. The, the, the girl that got married does not attend our church. But her church doesn't have a place to have a wedding. So the venue was here last night. And we were here and we were hanging out. We were waiting for the wedding to get over because what did we need to do? Clean up. Clean up. Because all these tables and chairs were in the gym. And the kitchen was a mess. And the floors needed sweeping. And all of that had to be done. And so there was a crew of us that were waiting for the wedding to get over. Now, we enjoyed the wedding. She was beautiful, and, and the wedding reception was beautiful. But how many of you know that we were looking at our watches? But anyway, when you have a job to do, sometimes you get impatient with others who are doing their job because you want them to get out of the way so you can do your job. And God is telling us, be patient. Be long-suffering. Be willing to wait. How many of you like to wait? Mm -mm, not me. Not so much. So go to 1 Timothy. And let's start. Let's start. Uh, 1 Timothy. Let's start in chapter 2. Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Do you need a witness in your life? Does there need to be a testimony in your life? Don't you ever let me come up here and teach when you don't know who I am teaching you. Do you hear me? Don't sit under somebody's teaching that you don't know something about their character. Because the Bible says there are wolves in the body of Christ. And you've got to know the difference. Because if you don't, the Bible says in the last days, the very elect will be deceived if they're not able to separate the, the lies from the truth. You're, you need to be very careful who, who you sit under. Very careful who you sit under. So he's telling Timothy this. Was Timothy his blood son? No, but he was a blood Jesus son, wasn't he? They chose each other. You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. What God gives you, you give to others. Amen. I sat across last night from a precious couple that I knew their mother and daddy. We grew up together and we were sharing stories. We were because he it was Father's Day weekend and he his daddy's died and gone on to be with the Lord. And I said, let me tell you a story about your daddy. And I started telling him a story about his earthly daddy. And he said, Miss Jeannie, I never heard this. And we were just dying laughing, telling a story about his daddy. And he said, thank you. He said, I feel better. Now, it was a simple story. But we do that in the lives of the others, right? The Holy Spirit says for us to be an encourager. It even describes it. Be the lifter of a head. When you see a head that's down, that's the Holy Spirit telling you, say something encouraging. Lift them. Lift them up. And when you do that, the Holy Spirit comes in and they physically get lifted up. You can see a change in their countenance. Amen? So read on. Uh-oh. Next two words. Uh-oh. Endure suffering along with me. Paul never asked anybody to do anything he wasn't willing to do. Paul didn't ask other people to feed him and lift him up as a preacher and put him on a pedestal. What did Paul do for a living? He made tents, which was heavy, hard work. He made tents. Enduring suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life, for then they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. And athletes cannot win the prize unless they follow the rules. And hardworking farmers should be the first to enjoy the fruit of their labor. Do not begrudge a pastor for what the church blesses him with. He deserves the blessings of the people. It says right here, let the farmer eat the best fruit. Let him get the first watermelon for crying out loud. Think about what I am saying. Think about it. Don't just take something in and let it come in and flow right out. Ruminate on it. Think about it. Spend time with the Lord and let the Lord teach you. It's not all going to come instantly. Let the Lord teach you. 
Some of us have to learn by having a lesson. Amen? How many of you have ever run out of gas in your vehicle? I hope you learned a lesson. Now, there were some people like my daddy that didn't. I went to get my hair cut one day out at Long Hammock, had a, a gas can in the back of her shop. And I come to find out that she kept it there full of gas for my daddy. I said, Miss Carolyn, I'm so sorry. She said, no, it's not a big deal. Because my daddy had a route that he ran in his old truck to Ocala and back. And he came back the Long Hammock way. And he would run out of gas. And I would say to him, Daddy, I know your gas gauge doesn't work. But you got gas. Figure out how many miles you can go and kind of keep track. And Daddy wouldn't. And he'd run out of gas. You're enabling him. And she said, no, I love him and I enjoy the time I get to spend with him. And it's okay. Did she have a good attitude? Better than mine. She had a good attitude about it, right? There are things in our lives that it are they're, they're ongoing. There are things that the Lord's working with us. Some things you get over right away. Some of y'all may have a temper. And if you have a temper, it's an ongoing thing that God's changing you. Amen? Some of you may be like me. You have a mouth that runs on too much. And the Lord puts a bit in your mouth, but he does not tighten the bit to where you bleed. He tightens the bit every time that you get out of line to slow you down and teach you. Amen? Makes a difference. So, think about what I'm saying. The Lord will help you understand all these things. But you have to let the Holy Spirit do it. You have to listen to the Holy Spirit. You have to know the voice of God. How do you know the voice of God? Relationships. Relationships. If Ted was at the front door of the gym right this minute, and he called me, I would hear him. Because I've lived with him 51 years. I know his voice. In order to know somebody, you have to spend time with them. You have to spend time with them. The Bible is God talking to you and when you read this bible you start to recognize who's talking to you amen all right so it says always remember that jesus christ a descendant of king david was raised from the dead this is the good news i preach you say jenny i'm not a preacher how many people in here are not a preacher we're all teachers we're all parents we're all preachers you say, no, Jenny, I'm not called to the pulpit. You don't have to be in the pulpit to preach. This is, and we're going to have to close in just a second. This is the good news I preach. And because I preach this good news, I am suffering and have been chained like a criminal. Does that sound like a fun Christian job? But the word of God cannot be chained. So I am willing to endure anything if it will bring salvation and eternal glory in Christ Jesus, to those God has chosen. This is a trustworthy saying. Put your, put your hand right here. This is where you need to study. If we die with him, we will also live with him. If we endure hardship, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful. For he cannot deny who he is. Y'all, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. He loves us. He loves us. He loves us. I'm going to give you some homework this week. I want you to go back and I want you to study this week Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. I've studied it all of my Christian life. And it was only yesterday that the Holy Spirit showed me something that I had been missing. When Jesus spoke to his disciples, and they went to the garden. He told the one group of disciples to stay here. He called three disciples and told them to go with him a little further. I've always said he called them to go to prayer, but that's not the first thing it says. It's not the first thing it says. It says, come and sit. Oh, see what the Holy Spirit just did to y'all, what he did to me yesterday. Come and sit. Come and sit here. Jesus wants us to come and be with him. Come and sit. Come and be with me. Don't have to open your mouth. Don't have to say a thing. On Tuesday nights, 
We come and pray on Tuesday nights. Some sit, some walk, some read their Bibles. There are times, Tuesday night was one of them for me. There are times when I, I, I say all I can do is sit. But I learned yesterday that that's big. I, I learned yesterday that Jesus said, come and sit. He just wants to be with you. And you say, well, I, I don't know how to pray. I can't pray. That's not the first thing he asks you. He asks you to come and sit. So this week, I want you to study the Garden of Gethsemane. I want you to pray and ask the Lord to pour that into your life about sitting with Jesus, being with Jesus, getting to know Jesus better. On a Sephoris, went a thousand miles. It's in Timothy. Study that this week. It went a thousand miles just to be a comfort to Timothy. Let God this week speak into your heart things that God wants you to do that you can make the difference in the life of somebody else. Amen? When God calls you to do that email, do that email. Do that card, do that card. Make that phone call, make that phone call. Go to somebody's house and take them whatever you're good at cooking. Whatever God calls you to do. Brian, take them fishing. Whatever God calls you to do, the Bible says he's only going to ask you what you've got in your hand. The gifts that he's given you. Father, we thank you for this lesson this morning. Father, we all have gifts. And some are searching this morning for their gift. Lord, speak to their heart. Let the Holy Spirit teach them. Let that calling, not just a vocation, but that calling come back upon their life of the purpose that you have for them. Lord, our purpose is sharing you and your love with everybody that we meet. Instill in us, Father God, instill in us, Father God, that this is our time and this is our season and this is our opportunity with our life to make a difference. And we give you glory and honor and praise in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank y'all. On behalf of our pastor and staff here at OAG, we want to say thank you. Thank you for being a part of our ministry. We are grateful for you and the support you give our church and its ministries so that we can continue to do what God has called us to do, to be the family church for the family of God. For more content from Pastor Strickland and Oxford Assembly of God, check out our media website at oag.church/media.